In this lesson, we're going to go through three different theorems that are going to help us to be able to factor polynomials of degree higher than two that have rational roots. So any root that could be written as a fraction. So first, we're just going to jump right in with our theorems. The first theorem is called the remainder theorem. So So the remainder theorem, remember in the last lesson we looked at polynomial long division and synthetic division, and we saw that we can actually divide, divide um, binomials into polynomials and come up with what the remainder is. So the remainder theorem says there's a shortcut for getting that remainder, okay? So if P of X is divided by x minus a, there's our binomial, the remainder is p of a. So this is not a shortcut for division. It's not going to tell us what the quotient is, but it will tell us what the remainder would be. Um, so let's look at a quick example. We have x to the power of 25. Make that two a little more clear minus 3x to the 17 plus 1 is divided by x plus 1. What is the remainder? Now, this is only a three-term polynomial, but the degree of this polynomial is 25. So if we were going to do synthetic division or polynomial long division, we would actually need to write out all 25 coefficients, including all the zeros. So it would be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way till you get to minus 3, then a whole bunch more zeros. And you'd have to do every single step of that division. And that would be super, super, super annoying, and we don't want to do that. So the remainder theorem says if we want to find the remainder, all we have to do is plug in a. So remember, if we're looking here, we have divided by x minus a. So the a that we're going to plug in is the zero of that binomial, the thing that makes it zero. So we are going to plug in, so we have x plus one, so x plus one equals x minus a. That would give us negative one is the a we want to plug in. So again, we're plugging in the zero here. So p of minus one is going to be negative 1 to the power of 25 minus 3 times negative 1 to the power of 17 plus 1. Okay, so negative 1 to an odd power is going to be negative 1. If we're an even power, it would be positive 1. Negative 1 to the 17 also to an odd power, so that's negative 3 times negative 1, which gives us positive 3 plus 1, and negative 1 plus 3 plus 1 gives us positive 3. So the remainder is 3. We have no idea what the quotient is, really would prefer not to find it, but we do know what the remainder is here. Okay, so the remainder theorem is pretty cool, but the biggest use of the remainder theorem is actually what we would probably call a corollary or a special case of that remainder theorem or sort of an additional thing that comes out of the remainder theorem, which is what if the remainder is zero? So if the remainder is zero, it means that that binomial is a factor. And that is pretty useful if you are trying to factor a polynomial. So the factor theorem, this is our second of our many theorems. Okay. So the factor theorem states that P of X, our polynomial, has a factor x minus a if and only if p of a equals zero. Okay, so what is this if and only if? This is a really technical kind of math way of saying that this goes both ways. So an example of an if and only if is like the Pythagorean theorem. So if you have a right triangle, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. If a squared plus b squared equals c squared, then you have to have a right triangle. That's the only way you can get a squared plus b squared to equal c squared. In this case, what we have is you have a factor f, 
x minus a if and only if p of a equals zero. So that means if you plug in a and p of a is zero, then x minus a has to be a factor. And that's the way that we're gonna use this theorem more and more and more. But we also know that if x minus a is a factor, if you plug a in, you would for sure get zero. And this makes sense based on what we know about how things factor. So it goes both ways. So let's, let's see what are the implications of this. So example two, okay, given p of x equals x cubed minus x squared minus 5x plus 2 are x minus 1 and x plus 2 factors. So here, this was really going to have to be solved up until now by using polynomial long division or, you know, synthetic division and then trying to see if we have a remainder or not. And if we don't have a remainder, then we know it actually goes in. Um, so that takes a long time. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try to see what p of 1, so here a is equal to 1 and here our a equals minus 2. We're just going to plug these in and see if they're actually factors. So you get p of 1 equals 1 cubed minus 1 squared minus 5 plus 2. And that gives me 1 minus 1 is 0, minus 5 plus 2 is negative 3. So x plus x minus 1 is not a factor because it's got a remainder. So any remainder that's non-zero is going to be, means that it's not a factor. So let's try p of 2. We get p of 2 is negative 2 cubed minus negative 2 squared minus 5 times negative 2 plus 2, which gives us negative 8 minus 4, because we're squaring it first, get rid of that minus, but then we have another minus, plus 10 plus 2. So we have minus 12 plus 12, which gives us 0. So x plus 2 is a factor. Okay, so interesting. So now we have a way to determine if a particular binomial is actually a factor of a polynomial without having to go through the long process of polynomial long division. Okay, um, now we can actually use this to do something above. So now let's factor p of x, okay? So we've got x plus 2 being a factor. So now what I can do is I can use synthetic division. Okay. We could have just started by doing synthetic division on these numbers, but again, the synth synthetic division process takes a bit of time, so we prefer to only apply it when we need to apply it. So I'm going to plug in minus 2. I get my coefficients, if I look back at the polynomial, are 1, minus 1, minus 5, and 2. So I'm going to write 1, minus 1, minus 5, and positive 2. I'm going to bring down that 1. Minus 2 times 1 is minus 2. Add them together, I get minus 3. Uh, minus 2 times minus 3 is positive 6. That gives me a positive 1. Minus 2 times positive 1 is negative 2. That gives me a zero remainder as I determined using the factor theorem. So now I can rewrite this polynomial, okay, p of x, which was x cubed minus x squared minus 5x plus 2, and that's going to be equal to x plus 2 times this leftover polynomial, which is x squared minus 3x plus 1, okay? Well, now can I factor this quadratic? Are there any numbers that multiply to be positive 1 and add to be negative 3? No. But if I did want to see if I could find any solutions, any more solutions for x equals 0 for this, pol uh, sorry, for where the polynomial is equal to 0 or any more roots of this polynomial, then I do now have the option to use the 
quadratic formula. Okay, so the quadratic formula would be able to tell me whether or not there are any more solutions, or I can just use the discriminant to see. So b squared minus 4ac, which is negative 3 squared, 9 minus 4, which gives me 5. So there will be solutions. So there are going to be two irrational solutions because we have to take the square root of 5. We don't necessarily have to use the whole quadratic formula just to figure out there are going to be two more solutions for this. So we just determined that this cubic has three x-intercepts and we can actually, if we decided to go through and do the whole quadratic formula, we could actually find what those solutions are. So all this is cool, but if you recall, we look back at the beginning of that problem and I told you which two factors to check. I said, let's, let's check minus one and two. Uh, sorry, t positive one and minus two and see if those are roots of the equation or see if there, we have a factor of x plus x minus one and x plus two. So if you're just given a polynomial and asked to go through the process of factoring it to find possibly to find the exit intercepts possibly for your own purposes, how would you know which numbers that you could check? Is there any limitations or do you just randomly start picking numbers and guessing and checking until you find something, which I know a lot of you don't like the idea that there's not a system. So here we get another theorem, which doesn't eliminate the need for a bit of guessing and checking, but what it does do is it narrows down the possibilities for what you need to guess. So it will give you a chance to make a slightly more educated guess in a sense. So theorem number three, is called the rational root theorem. And rational, remember, means that you can write it as a fraction of, a, of an integer over an integer. So if f of x equals a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a1 x plus a naught. You may recognize this as this is our general polynomial. Then every rational zero of f of x has the form p over q, where p, your numerator, is factors of a naught, which is your constant term, and q is factors of a sub n, which is your what we call your leading coefficient, so the coefficient of the first highest degree term. Okay, so essentially this tells us what numbers to check. So it's every factor of your constant term divided by every factor of your leading coefficient, and that's going to give you your possibilities. Okay, so let's actually use this to do a problem that has been escaping us. Example, this is called the putting it all together example. And this is just awesome because we're now just gonna take everything we've done in like the last three lessons and put it into just one thing, okay? So we are going to now Find the x-intercepts of p of x. So we're doing something that would really help us be able to graph this polynomial that we probably wouldn't have been able to graph before, of x to the fourth plus 4x cubed minus 7x squared minus 34x minus 24. 
And yes, this does only work with polynomials with certain coefficients. You can't just pick a random polynomial and expect this to necessarily work because if it doesn't have any rational roots, the rational root theorem is not going to be super helpful. But for polynomials that do have at least one or two or three possibly rational roots, this is going to help you figure out what some of those are and allows you to factor higher degree polynomials that do factor. Ones that don't factor, we don't yet have a good or efficient way. And generally, there is a cubic formula, but it's excessively complicated and it's really quite rarely used. So we are going to, there are actually better methods of estimating roots once you get to calculus, if you need to do that. So check. We know that a naught equals 24. That's our constant term. Okay, and I'm writing positive 24 even though it says minus 24 because all of the numbers that we're checking are going to be, we're going to look at both the positive and the negative. So a sub n equals 1. So for our p of x, here are our possible, root, possible roots or possible zeros. Okay. We have plus minus one, I'm just starting from the beginning, plus minus two, all listing all the factors of 24. Plus minus three, plus minus four, plus minus six, five isn't a factor, plus minus eight. I've gotten into the paired factors, six and four, eight and three, so 12 and two, and plus minus 24. So generally, I almost always start with one because it's easier. But that said, I can tell that positive one isn't going to work pretty quickly. So I can try x minus 1 here. And so we'll try p of 1. See if that's a factor. So p of 1 is 1 to the fourth plus 4 times 1 cubed minus 7 times 1 squared minus 34 times 1 minus 24. I can see immediately that I have 5 positive and then a lot of negatives. So that's not going to work. So nope, x minus 1 is not a factor. Let's try x minus 2. I'm going to plug in 2. Remember, we're plugging in the 0. That's 2 to the power of 4 plus 4 times 2 cubed minus 7 times 2 squared minus 34 times 2 minus 24. Again, I'm just going to look at my positive. 2 to the fourth is 16. 16 plus 32 is going to be outweighed by a minus 28, minus 68, minus 24. It's still, this is going to come out negative, so it's not going to work. Okay. So now let's try, I could keep going with three, but for now I'm actually going to try x plus one. So we're going to plug in a minus one. Okay. So I get p of minus one. So that gives us negative 1 to the power of 4 plus 4 times negative 1 to the third minus 7 times negative 1 squared minus 34 times negative 1 minus 24. And that gives me, if I actually work it out, I've got 1 minus 4 minus 7 plus 34 minus 24. So in the pluses, I've got 35. And in the minuses, I have minus 11 minus another 24, which actually also equals, so I have 35 minus 35. So this one actually does equal zero. So that is going to be one of my roots. Okay, so x plus one is going to be a factor of this polynomial. So now what I'm going to do is figure out what's the other side. So I'm going to do synthetic division with this minus one. So we used our Rational root theorem to start off, then we use the factor theorem, which is a corollary of our remainder theorem. Now we know we've got a good remainder of zero, so we're going to go 1, 4, minus 7, minus 34, minus 24, and we're going to bring it down. We got 1, we got minus 1, 4 plus minus 1 is 3, 1 times minus 1 times 1 minus 3, that gives us minus 10, times minus 1 is positive 10, giving us minus 24, times minus 1 is positive 24, that gives us our zero remainder. So now I can write my polynomial of x is equal to x plus 1 times my leftover bit here, so that's x squared 
sorry, x cubed, because that's our highest power, plus 3x squared minus 10x minus 24. Okay, so now I have a choice. I can go back and start plugging things into p again, or I can think of this polynomial here as being like a q of x. Because I don't really have to, I don't have to worry about factoring the whole thing. I factored the whole thing once, now I just have to worry about factoring this cubic here. And it's actually smaller and plugging numbers into here is going to be easier than doing it into something with a fourth degree term. So let's try x plus 4. Okay. So x plus 4, we're going to do q of minus 4. And that's going to be negative 4 cubed plus 3 times minus 4. I could have tried 3, but I don't really want to. Okay. Minus 4 squared minus 10 times minus 4 minus 24. So when I simplify that all out, I get negative 64 plus 48 plus 40 minus 24. Positives, I have 88. Negatives, I have 88. So that also equals 0. Okay, so now I'm going to go and I got minus 4 and I'm going to divide and I get 1. I'm going to just divide it into q of x because I already know I've got that x plus 1 factor. 3, we don't need the x, sorry, we need minus 10 here, minus 24. And then we come down. 1 times minus 4 is minus 4, that gives me minus 1. Minus 4 times minus 1 is 4, that gives me minus 6. And that gives me positive 24 and a zero remainder. So now I can rewrite my p of x. So I'm going back to my original one because I have my x plus one already. We talked about that. Now I've got my x plus four and I've got another factor which is x squared minus x minus six. So I could carry on and say, well, this is really like another, maybe an r of x and now I can go back and try plugging stuff in. But I also noticed that r of x is a quadratic and funnily enough, I've taken both math 10 and free calc 11, so I at this point know how to factor a quadratic. So p of x is going to be equal to x plus 1 times x plus 4. x squared minus x minus 6, numbers that multiply to negative 6 and add to minus 1, that would give me an x minus 3 and an x plus 2. That multiplies to negative 6, adds to negative 1. So now I've actually factored this entire polynomial. I can go back and see what was the question ask, asking. Okay. So what was the question asking? The question was asking to find the x-intercepts of this polynomial. So now I can say the x-intercepts are minus 1 minus 4, positive 3, and minus 2. So I know all of the x-intercepts. And then if I wanted to, I could go and do all my steps and graph this polynomial that probably it would have been a bit challenging for me to graph before.